Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 517, featuring an interview with EXO of EXODOS. Now, if you're not familiar with this project, you really should be. It's absolutely amazing uh, if you're a fan of DOS games uh, and uh, early uh, Windows games, uh, Windows 95 era. <laughs> it's just a huge source for not just the games themselves, but all the documentation, the manuals, pictures of the discs, the, even the registration cards, links to magazines. It's just kind of a, a historian or a retro gamer uh, dream. Uh, it's incredible work, and I know uh, the guy that we're about to hear from, EXO, has done an amazing job, staggering <laughs> amount of work uh, building this resource, putting together a wonderful community. Uh, on Discord and YouTube, and I really want to have him on to talk about this project and get his thoughts on uh, the state of uh, game preservation today. And I, yeah, I think you'll see he's a really great speaker <laughs> in addition to uh, all of this uh, wonderful archival work. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. XO. Mm, hi, XO. Howdy, howdy. Looks like you got quite the collection back there. Castle Grayskull in the back. It is. I've got uh, Snake Mountain below oh, me. Too big oh. to fit up there. <laughs> I didn't realize you had such a big collection, but I guess it makes sense. You said you like board games and, and collecting for consoles as well as, of course, the DOS. How many? How many of those little uh, little toys and collectibles do you have? I have never counted. I'm the kind of guy that rips the package open and puts them on the wall and poses them and does fun stuff with them. I'm not a I'm not a collector for cash. I'm a collector for the fun of having them. Don't have any super rare items or anything like that? But... Yeah, you know they're up there. There's a couple of these guys that you know they've got stories behind them. Um, is that a know, system, system Shock T-shirt you got on there? Is it? it is. It is. I just now noticed that system. <laughs> oh, wow, that's cool. Now that you look the part, but I guess it makes a lot of sense. Somebody that's in, interested in uh, software preservation, there's probably a collector mindset that sort of goes along with that. Would you say? Yeah, I think so. Uh, especially the fact that I'm, you know, to tie into what we we're just talking about, the fact that I'll rip these toys open and put them on the wall. It kind of requires that mentality to preserve software. You need to get these boxes and flatten them to scan them properly. You kind of have to be a little destructive to preserve uh, sometimes. I love that. You know, I run into people all the time, and I've talked about this off and on <laughs> over, the, over the decades. It feels like, you know, but some people, they get a, uh, say, a game, and it's one of their favorite games, but it's still still in the plastic, let's say. Or same thing with the collectible, and they won't ever take it out of the box. Yeah. And I, I don't have that gene or whatever. <laughs> I'm like you. <laughs> like, I want to open this thing immediately, because part of the thrill is going through all the contents. No, yeah. always, who are you saving it for? You know, it's, I mean, nobody's going to enjoy it more than you. <laughs> it's like having a, an amazing sports car in your garage or a motorcycle or an ATV and never riding it, never going out for a joyride. Like, it's neat to own these things, um, but I think it's neater to experience them. And that kind of ties into the challenge of preserving games is a movie can be experienced very easily through a million different methods. You can listen to music a million different ways, but games have to be directly interacted with to appreciate them. You can't watch someone else. I mean, you can. There are long plays that are huge on YouTube right now, but mm -hmm. maybe they don't make the same choices you would. And so you're not getting a personal experience with that game the same way you would if you did it yourself. Yeah. And to preserve a game properly, you have to give it to people in a way that everybody from any age range or technical know-how can jump in and interact with it and actually have a legit experience with it where they're not, you know, I can have the box and shrink wrap and I can put it on a shelf. Uh, maybe the strong museum has it or the Smithsonian has it. And we can all, you know, shake hands and say, good, that's been preserved. But if we can't appreciate it, if we can't experience it, then I, 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 I don't know. Do we really have it preserved at that point? Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, I, I'm just kind of, I'm still, Thinking about what you said there about that. That was a great line about the, there's a destructive oh, yeah. element. That, you know, that's really brilliant the way you put that. But, you know, I so get what you mean by that. That's, <laughs> yeah, I think in that with, with the toys, you know, not to get too <laughs> distracted with those, but, you know, I can go back and play video games I played as a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody thinks twice about it. Well, I used to like Pac-Man. Of course you do. It's, you know, it's a great game, whatever. 
Uh, but I don't know if they would have the same reaction if I started playing with the toys I had <laughs> when I was a kid. The same way, you know, pew, pew, pew. I mean, you know, you probably had a similar childhood, right? <laughs> well, see, that's the benefit of having kids. When I, mean, I got all these things and started setting them up in here. You what's know, the like, difference yeah. between playing with the toys and playing with the games, I guess? Well, my kids came back here the first time they saw me setting it all up. And my son, at the time, he was like six. He was like, oh, can we play with the giant castle with the skull face? And I was like, yeah. sure. Man. <laughs> so we pulled it down, we got the toys out, and I played He Man with him for the day. And you know, oh, that's nice. you know, that's my chance to get to kind of relive that part of my life again. It doesn't make like you said, it doesn't make sense for me to sit down and pull them all out. And I'm, I'm not gonna have the same kind of fun I used to have back then. You know, I'm not gonna get the same thing out of it that I got out when I was five or six. But to watch my son get that out of it, to sit there with him and experience it with him, that's about as close as I'm ever gonna get again. You know, that's one of the best arguments for having kids I think I've ever heard. <laughs> play with your toys again. <laughs> yeah. I, I get to watch them play games like King's Quest for the first time. And yeah. my daughter at, at seven was figuring things out that I couldn't figure out at 12. And I'm sitting here thinking, she's a genius. How did she figure that out? <laughs> Especially considering she doesn't speak that language in terms of the idea of a point and click game where you have to combine items all the time. There is a certain syntax that we get used to when we play them all the time you kind of learn like the limitations of these games well she came into it cold she had played i think one or two putt putt games and i think we had played like a uh, pajama sam together and from there she was like wanting to play fantasy so i thought well let's do king's quest six and see how that goes and she right off the bat figured out some of the stuff that you have to do to get the hidden ending and i couldn't get that stuff at, at her age well at twice her age i wasn't getting that stuff yeah, some of those puzzles in those games are kind of notorious for moon logic. <laughs> Unless there's something like with a unicorn, it's tricky. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about King's Quest Four, and you're talking about the unicorn's bridle. Um, yeah, yeah I know you're that somebody who knows these games well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that particular one is one I use all the time as an example of just complete BS. Um, that puzzle was designed to sell hint books and. Ken Williams was not shy about saying that. He was very upfront that they put the puzzle in to sell hint books or to drive people to their 900 hint line. Uh, they put the bridle inside of a boat on an island. You can't go to the island again. You get to the island after you come out of the whale. Once you, um, I think, play a whistle, the dolphin comes and takes you away. But the shenanigans about this is if you say look around, it says you see nothing. If you say look at the ground, it says you see sand. To find the bridle, you have to literally walk your character over and stand within the uh, the hull of a of a broken like canoe little little boat, and you have to say while standing in that piece of ground, look at the ground, and then it will say you see something shiny. So anywhere else in, in the game, if you say look at the ground, it'll be like, well, there's something weird under the bridge over there, or maybe I could get behind the waterfall. They give you hints. This one's like, nope, you don't see anything. <laughs> Just move on. I think that was intentionally designed to be impossible. That's what they said. Just yeah. Walk. Do you think yep. they were being honest about that? Or was it just clunky puzzle? I think they were because at the time they were probably making more money off their hymn books than they were the games. And these games weren't cheap. We're talking about $60, $70 oh. games in 1988, 89. So with inflation, $200, $250 games. Probably more like two, two or $3,000. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you buy the computer for sure? Yeah, I remember. I don't know. I, I've never talked to Ken, but I've I certainly had other uh, folks from Sierra on. Mm -hmm. and some of those and lucas uh, same thing and yeah i've heard more than one say that they made more money from the hint books yeah. which always made me curious as, as to if that was the case why would they let brady and all these other prima you know and all these other companies get in on that well for uh, someone like sierra they were doing it in-house yeah. so that was money directly to them um and i think the reason they made so much money off them was because uh copy protection piracy a lot of these people playing Leader Suit Larry did not buy the game, but they would pay for the hint. Oh, that ain't so. The game. <laughs> so they were making money off people who didn't pay for the game by selling them hints. And really, you know, this discussion of the hint books, this might be a good segue to kind of get into some Exodus or really okay. to talk. Because one of the things you are about is not just the ROM, obviously, yeah. you know, not just the game. There's all these other elements, and it could be a hint book, it could be a magazine. Uh, it could be uh, it's all sorts of what some people might call ephemera. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I would agree with you that it's actually not just ephemeral stuff. It's it's an important part of the experience. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can pick up on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, 
you kind of hinted at this earlier when you said you like to open the box and, and see all the stuff inside of it. That was an integral part of the experience back then. And when you were paying the equivalent of a couple hundred dollars for a game, you know, especially like an Infocom game where the game itself is just text. So they have to create the world that you're about to go read about. And they get one chance at it as far as the box cover art. And beyond that one piece of art on the cover of the box, everything else is your imagination. So they would enhance that imagination by doing things like packing little pebbles, uh, pins, business cards, matchbooks. All these little things were in there. Now, we can't... Well, parallel, resist parallel resistant sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, there, there was all kinds of crazy stuff. had the face on the box, you know, that three-dimensional sort of face on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, was, it, uh, was it Synergist? Uh, Starcross? No. Oh, Deja Vu had it. The first Star Deja Vu. I'm sorry, which one? Starcrossed? Starcrossed. Starcrossed uh -huh. was in a, a 3D box that looked yeah, like a spaceship, I think. A round one. But I think I the first Deja one, Vu had, had like... Um, I thought that was really neat. But I... Yeah, it looked like a guy's face and it was reversed. And so it's almost like the uh, the bust in the Haunted Mansion. It looks like it's following you when you walk past it because of the way they <laughs> inverted it. Now that's yeah. a box. <laughs> that, it, it calls out to you when you walk past that thing. I mean, when the face is following you around the store. <laughs> Yeah, this is all important part of it. Now, we can't put the matchbooks in your pocket when you download Exodus, but we can scan it all and make sure that when you click on a game, you can right-click that game and you'll see there's the basics. You got, if we can find it, you've got the manual. Um, but beyond that, if we can find a registration card, we'll put that in there. If there was a contest form, we'll scan that in there because that tells you a little bit about the era. If there is a technical addendum, uh, an installation addendum, anything we can find in that box, we'll scan it. And that includes all the ephemera uh, or, or the pieces. But there's also really cool stuff. Like there were the code wheels back in the day where you uh, had... Yes, yes. Yeah, you like, just like, one of the most popular ones. <laughs> you, you like those, huh? Well, we've taken them. And uh, thanks to one of the uh, volunteers of the project, we've made them interactive again. So it's an HTML and it pulls oh, up and you can pick and you can spin it now you don't have to we make it so that our games have been cracked so that you can pass these things but it's there for you if, if you want to uh to play with it and that's part of keeping the the some games the copy protection was not as simple as go to page 42 and tell me word seven huh. it was a lot more subtle than that but you still needed your paperwork yeah, uh, we are... also tried to get oh, strategy right, guys yes. All the gold ice games had those code wheels, and you know sometimes it was just for the copy protection. But I'm pretty sure that at least some of them would have a puzzle or some message at some point in the game where it wasn't copy protection, but you would use the wheel to get past to you know, maybe learn a bit more about a dungeon or a character or something. Yeah, you had things like uh, King's Quest Three had its spells in the in the in the manual, and you needed to cast the spells to beat the game. King's Quest Six had the Cliffs of Logic in there. There's one cool thing hidden in the King's Quest Six manual, and I've talked to hundreds of people that love that game that didn't realize this. But uh, in the manual, when it talks about the island of mythology, um, there's a, a Minotaur's dungeon. And above the talk of the dungeon with the Minotaur is this uh, picture. And it looks like the dungeon wall and it's bricks. The bricks are colored. Some are light and some are dark. And it's actually a map in the game to tell you which rooms you can go in are safe and which ones are not. And most people, you play the game and it, it turns into trial and error. You save your game, you walk through the door, you die. Okay, you reload, you don't walk through that door again. And you slowly work through trial and error through this whole dungeon. But they did provide a map in the manual hidden in the bricks that will get you through the dungeon safely if you know that that's what it's for. That is really cool. <laughs> Maybe not so cool if you had the pirated version, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that synergy between the, the printed stuff and yeah, it's just it's really, maybe you could uh, show us Exodus real quick while we're talking about this. Sure, let me pull up. Because uh... you, uh... okay, let's see here. I think people will be excited when they see all the other stuff that's available there beyond just all right basics now i'm gonna have to figure out how to uh grab control here from you oh does it not automatically give you control well, i says you're the co-host i think you should just be able to say share the screen down at the bottom there we go yeah pop, there we go pop it on there we go and there all right, so this right here 
is Exodos. We have, um, I've got this one merged with my Windows 3X project and my uh, Dream project. Uh, but in Exodus right now, we're at version six. We've got 7,633 games. Wow. Um, it spans from 1980 all the way up until 2023 uh, with Sigil 2 that just came out. Uh, the free add-on pack for Doom that uh, John Romero put together. Oh, cool. Uh, but as you come through here, like, let's see, let's go to something that I know has a lot of extras. Uh, Secret of Monkey Island. Now, it might get loud because we have music on all the games. But it didn't start. <laughs> now, if you come down here to extras, you're going to see we have the CD oh. version licensing agreements, quick start cards, registration cards, user guides, the design documents from the game. Now, that's something that your last guest uh, or one of your most recent guests, Frank Cifaldi, he did a whole interview with Ron Gilbert and they procured these design documents. Um, we have the Dial of Pirate. There's the design docs right there. You can go through and see how they came like up the with super, ideas from the puzzles. Super duper collector's edition. Oh, and then of course, Acrobat's got to get in the way now. Let me close that out. Yes, it is kind of like a collector's edition. If we go over here, we have Dial a Pirate, which is the code wheel. Oh, yeah. You can come in here and you can turn it. And so you line up, uh, let's say, the monkey head, and we'll go to the front and we'll grab yes, the. You might, have to share, you might have to share a new screen for us to see the code wheel. Oh, I apologize. I forgot that it's locked to that one. Um, yeah, we're still looking at this. The game selection screen, I think. There we go. How about this? There we go. Yeah, what a... <laughs> so we can grab the front here and spin it around. Let's That's say we're going to grab that pirate face, and we'll go to the back and grab this guy's head, and now we can see that in Nebraska, 1688, that would be the code that we might want us to have. Oh, let me... Uh... Yeah, if we're going to have a game with the code wheels, it's nice when the code wheel itself is fun. It does. It does Great. help. And back over here at Exodus, we have um, recreations of the game cover, the hint book with the hints already revealed, um, reference cards. So, you know, you can hear the, the game music's playing when you're when you're browsing. That's a nice touch. Man, you're like, you know, you're super active with this, I have to say. I mean, the level of support here is incredible. Well, thank you. Um, each game, you're going to have the title screens. You're going to have images from the game that you can go through. And it will open those in a new window if I double click them. So I think that would cause a screen share issue. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is if you come over here under series, you can see that this is a Roland MT32 game. Yeah, so yeah, I was going to mention that. When you play this game, it'll ask you, like, okay, hey, we have... Um, Let's just assume that somebody watching this doesn't know what a Roland MT32, what the heck that is. Sure, that's a great uh, point. And so what I'll do is I'll come to my playlist over here. The MT32 is this guy right here. It was an external MIDI hardware device. Uh, at the time when it came out, it was like $800. So we're talking really expensive for a sound device. The serious uh, audio files only. A lot of the games, especially original Sierra games, starting with King's Quest IV, were composed with a Roland MT32. So if you have one of these or the ability to emulate one, then when you play these games, you're hearing them the way they were composed. So they would compose it on the MT32 and then downsample it to a more common card like the Sound Blaster or the AdLib oh. um, that most people have. And if you buy these games on good old games or Steam, you're going to hear the AdLib or Sound Blaster version of them. And you don't even get the option for something like the MT32. We also have... That's a really good point. So the Roland MT32 is not it's not upgrading the audio from these games. It's That's actually the way it was supposed to sound. Correct, correct. Um, you also have, let's see, uh, General MIDI, specifically through the um, the Sound Canvas 55. Where's Holy, I'll oh, look at all these options. So with the Sound Canvas, this was even higher quality and came out after the Roland MT32. You can see 550 of our games support the Sound Canvas. Um, if we go to, what was it, MT32, we're at 884 there. Uh, we have the Gravis Ultrasound, which um, it was one of those cards that people would swear by. But in most of the time, it just got a very uh, direct one-to-one -one copy of the Sound Blaster Adlib. But for certain companies like Epic Mega Games, they did program using the Gravis Ultrasound, also the Gus, as it was called. And so their yeah. games sound amazingly better when you run it through the Gus. 
Uh, I think we also, I don't have playlists specifically for them set up, but uh, well, we have the feature card. This is a brand new thing that uh, we just, I say we, DOSBox staging just got emulated uh, last year. Uh, it was a random little card. Uh, we, we also support yeah. a lot of other cards that I don't have on the list here. We've got feature cards. So there's some games made especially for that or the. A lot of times they weren't made specifically for it, but they do support it. Now, Sierra had this bad slash good habit of jumping on board with whatever hardware came along. So if you go through our catalogs, which we do include um, hundreds of catalogs originally uh, that publishers put out, you will see in the 1989 catalogs that they're really pushing the IBM feature card. And then you go to 1990 and they're suddenly really pushing the Roland MT32. <laughs> so, you know, you, you kind of like it was not beneficial to buy the first thing that Sierra told you to buy. Were they getting they paid on? Were they getting paid to support those? I wonder, or were they just, just I would guess they probably had signed a deal like we'll push it for you, but you'll give us a lot of extra, you know. Uh, you probably got demos of Sierra games packed in with your feature card if you bought it. But it was kind of pr cross promotional, is my guess. So I didn't uh, mean to cut you off. We're talking. No, about not that. at all. Not at all. Sorry. The card. So that was. Uh, does that sound good? Is it better than the some of these other options? I wonder. You know, my I'm totally favorite, I got to admit, I'm totally unfamiliar with the IBM feature card. Yeah, it was an, it was new to me too. Um, <laughs> if you start it, so in the Exodus manual, which is this cool little PDF that. Uh, comes free with the with the project when you download it. There is a page that talks about all of our different sound cards, and it kind of gives you just a, a brief, like, two-sentence blurb on what that sound card's about. And, mm -hmm. you know, the idea is not to bury new people with technical information. Uh, you know, th that's out there on the web if they want to find it. They can go to Wikipedia, and they can go to fan sites, and they can, really, they can read pages and pages about the Roland MT32. The important thing to note, for my project and the majority of people downloading it is it's better than what you had growing up. If you had one of these computers growing up, it's unless you happen to be the rich kid on the block, you didn't have a Roland MP32, but you've got your PC speaker. You've got Tandy after that, which was a, uh, it had three channels. So it sounded a little more dynamic. Then you get to one called the game blaster and the game blaster has this really gritty kind of uh, chunky sound to it. It's, I like it a lot. Personally, it doesn't, uh, sound amazing compared to new stuff, but it's got this really cool kind of 80s synth sound to it. Oh, okay. You sold me on that then. That's a neat one. Uh, there's actually a really cool video out there that I think Lazy Game Reviews did, one of your other recent guests. Uh, and he takes Secret of Monkey Island and plays it back through like eight or nine different sound cards. And maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe it's six. But it's a lot because it's one of the games that's a great example because it does support so many sound cards. And to hear the Monkey Island theme, which is probably my favorite gaming theme personally, it's a, such a great piece of music. To hear it in so many different formats really helps um, drive home the differences between these different sound cards. And this is something I wish I had had when I was writing some of my earlier books because it was so hard to find any copy of the game <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah. you know, much less support for uh, uh you know all these sound cards and things i mean yeah, I, would, we also try to... I wouldn't even known how to start you know try if i wanted to listen to mt32 <laughs> through just a standard dos box you know it would be it'd probably take me hours to try to figure out how to make that happen well someone but, had to teach me how to handle so it simple. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's not simple, and DOSBox is not a well-documented program. Oh. If you think about the barrier to entry of DOSBox, it's pretty high. You have to, A, be interested in DOS games. B, you have to know enough about MS-DOS itself to get around on the command prompt. Uh, C, you have to understand how to edit a CONF file, a comp file, to set up the machine that's going to run the game. And, you know, we're talking about a lot of, semi-esoteric knowledge that not everybody's going to come to the table with. And so you have to have a lot of patience. And, you know, like I said, I was doing it for eight or nine years before I realized how to set up the MT32 effectively. I had tried it one time and I got sound and it sounded like someone was banging pots and pans together. And I thought, wow, who would ever want that? And I just moved right along. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was not playing properly because it wasn't seeing the MT32 ROM file that has to be pointed to in the comp file. And so since it wasn't loading the sound banks, it was playing incorrect sounds. And I'd never heard what an MT32 should really sound like. So I didn't realize that the way I was doing things was wrong. 
so I wrote it off and moved along. And then eventually someone came along to the project, um, which is how most great things happen on my project is someone comes along that knows more than I do. And they teach me about these things. And we, you know, that turned into, okay, I guess I'm spending the next year enabling MT32 in 800 games. And then we could probably stop sharing the screen. At the... Yeah, sure, sure. Go back to see uh, the, the chat there. Yeah, one of the interesting things you talked about, XO, in, the, in this write-up I thought was fascinating was there's actually some negatives uh, about downloading a, a game from GOG, <laughs> goodoldgames.com. I know a lot of people, it's one of their cherished sites, you know, so I'm not, we don't, I don't think any of us mean disrespect, <laughs> you know, for them, but there is a, you know, if I understand this right, there, there's, this, I guess, a version of the game that's kind of easy, the easiest one to get up and running on a modern PC, uh, and that kind of becomes a de facto version and that everybody plays nowadays or downloads, even though it's not optimal, right? That there's ways you could tweak that. And, you know, like we talked about the MT32, there, there would be other ways to present that game that would be more uh, impressive, I suppose. Yeah, uh, I think it's... Kind of stuck with an inferior version of a game sometimes. Well, and I look at it this way. Yeah. Optimal and inferior are completely subjective to the person playing it. Um True. I have made a game run in a way that I thought was the best presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Alley Cat came out on the Tandy and the PC, uh, IBM, or early IBM PC DOS. And the PC version is a really low quality CGA graphics with beeps and boops on the PC speaker, whereas the Tandy version had like 16 color and had really nice sound. So when I set up the pack, I said, oh, Tandy's the way to go. And I got a lot of pushback on that because that's not the one people grew up playing. They yeah. played the other one. And that's yeah, how they wanted to experience that. it today. So that was my lesson. Don't assume what anybody wants. Give them every choice I can. Mm -hmm. And so while one might be technically better, that may not be what someone wants. But I guess the way I look at it is, and again, like you said, I appreciate the fact that a website like gog.com exists and that there is someone out there trying to sell these games that's a good that's a positive thing what i find negative about it is this belief that and not that they're perpetuating this it comes from the community that because gog is selling a game that game is preserved and i not only is that not true i find it to be the opposite the gog version of a game is destructive to preservation because if I go buy the King's Quest pack right now and I get King's Quest 1, 2, and 3, and uh, that's packed with one set, and the other ones are packed in the other, I get King's Quest 1 SCI version, which was the later 1991 remake. I do not mm -hmm. get the original 1987 PC DOS King's Quest that was on the AGI engine. They just don't even include it. And then with the SCI uh, version, I get AdLib Sound Blaster, the most common way of, of presenting it, which is fine. But they don't even leave the drivers in the game if you wanted to go reset it up with an MT32. If you had the institutional knowledge to do it, they're mm -hmm. not there. They've removed the drivers. They've removed the setup file. And we're talking about files that add up to one or two kilobytes. So it's hard to justify, in my opinion, the removal of these files because you're not saving a lot of space on the back end for your server. And I mean, you could argue, well, maybe they don't want to support it. Maybe if they include it, they have to support it. But as it stands right now, their forums are full of people explaining how to circumvent these issues by getting the files from other places and putting them in your GOG folder and then type this and type that and copy this, you know, resource file over. And now you've got MP32. So if you've already got all this time and effort being put into getting the game working in a way that was more original to how it was distributed, why not distribute it that way? Uh, I mean, they've got the rights. And, and they're putting it out there. And I think that it ties into something we're seeing recently, which I mentioned when we, when I wrote you earlier. If you look at these game preservation packages like the making of Karateka or Atari 50, they're approaching these from a collector standpoint. They're, you don't just get Karateka. You get all these games Jordan Mechner made leading up to it. You get design docs. You get interviews. You get this giant package. And so they can sell that for like $20, $30, even though if it was just Karatek alone, they'd be lucky to make two bucks off of it. Mm -hmm. If they pack the King's Quest games with, okay, here's the deal. Here's King's Quest one through eight. 
Uh, all the sound cards are supported. All the video cards are supported. Because late, like late uh, Sierra games had these EGA versions that are really rare, uh, where they would make the game in VGA, Super VGA, and then dither it down to EGA for the few people that were still out there that didn't have it yet. And these, they didn't, they didn't put those drivers on the VGA copy. You had to mail order or find a store that sold the EGA copy. So that, that made them pretty rare. But again, it's like, if that's the version you had back in the day, that's the one you want to play today. That's I mean, the one you remember. Curious. I mean, I'd just be curious to see it. Yeah, I, with me, it started out as, as a, I was a, I'm a Sierra collector. So, you know, I, I take, I do my videos in front of my, my, my toy wall, but I have my other rooms that are full of computer games. And I, to me, I figure everyone that does software videos does videos in front of their software wall. So I was going to be different. I was going to go in front of my toy wall, <laughs> but um I collected all these random versions of Sierra games. So I knew they existed because I was collecting them before the market went and people were like paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars for these games. Um, but to get to my point, if they put this out there and they put interviews with the people who worked at Sierra talking about the, that time period, if they talked about the Easter eggs that were in the original AGI version that got removed later, if they talked about the differences between the different ports, like, the Amiga version of King's Quest 4 has these really cool ambient sounds in the game. Like when you start off at the beach, you hear seagulls and you hear waves crashing. Um, when you're in the forest, you hear like birds chirping and, and like owls cooing. Uh, we actually have a really cool version in Exodus where uh, a fellow took the sound from the Amiga version. He mapped it to the Gravis ultrasound channel. Then we take the MT32 music and we map it to the MT32 channel, the MIDI channel. And then we got the sound effects from a later version of the game. We mapped it to the Sound Blaster channel. And you can play the game today with all three running at the same time in Exodus. It's called King's Quest IV Ultimate Version. And it is so cool to start that game up and hear all these sounds that weren't there originally uh, because they were on the Amiga version only. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, again, writing those books about the role-playing games, you know, always thinking about this, all these different ports of these games as well. <laughs> you know, people don't realize that um, you know, modern gamers, I don't think, know if they had the same conception of what it was like when you had maybe seven different ports. <laughs> yeah, <IRQ laughs> all these different computers, and they're very memory. different, sometimes completely different teams <laughs> work on them, you know. And it wasn't a case of here's the code, you know, just adapt it a little bit, tweak it a little bit, and it'll run on this you know, computer, a lot of times they had to rewrite everything from scratch to get it to work. Yeah, there's some really bad DOS ports, uh, especially <laughs> in the in the mid 80s. There's some really bad DOS ports out there. Yeah, I, I do think, though, that if they put all that stuff together in one package, they could sell it for, you know, right now, King's Quest is like four dollars on GOG. Well, why not make the thirty dollar version, the forty dollar version that has everything that treats it like something that is collectible? Maybe they just haven't missed the idea just not occurred to them. I mean, you know, I, I'm kind of surprised thinking about it. I've interviewed, like I said, I've interviewed so many of these developers. <laughs> I'm amazed nobody, no publishers ever come along and said, hey, can we take your, we'd like to include this interview you did uh, as part of this collectible, uh, yeah. you know, blind collector. So, I mean, well, I'd be happy to, you know, work with somebody. Well, and that goes into something, I think that YouTube documentaries and interviews are now becoming part of that ephemera we were talking about prior. When I did my Exo Dream collection, I went out, and that one's all about Lucas Arts games. Aaron Giles has put together this amazing emulator called Dream. He, uh, he actually was a porter at Lucas Arts back in the day, so he had worked on porting these games. So he made this emulator that can go in, and um, it's what's cool about his emulator is it's not like DOS Box. It's not just DOS games. It's not like Scum VM because it's not just adventure games. It's mm -hmm. every Lucas Arts game. So there's games he's got running in there that are like Windows 9X era games, which is really hard to emulate right now. Yeah, we got to talk about that at some point because he had said that the that's the most challenging games is that sure there's that little when was yeah. it Windows uh, 95? <laughs> Starting with Windows 95 going up until, you know, I mean it goes beyond XP, but you know, what I'm looking at as a as a tangible like project would be Windows 98, Windows 95, the 9X era. Yeah, I got I was having so much trouble with that era when I was doing my book, so I, I I came very close, and I didn't actually pull the trigger on this, but I was just going to buy an old PC <laughs> just because it was so hard. And yeah. then to get screenshots, you know, there was even, you know, a tougher challenge. Yeah. I don't That's know. Cool. What is it that makes these, you'd think the later games would be easier uh, than the older ones in some way, but I mean, what, what is it that makes it so hard uh, to emulate these these the games from this era? I think that there's 
a giant challenge with the fact that there is not this hard cutoff point from Windows 95 until today in terms of like name. It's not like the Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo right. 64. Like it's not these eras, right? If you go to like Moby Games and you go to Windows Games, there's two categories: Windows 3X and Windows. And Windows is everything from 1994 Windows 95 till today, and it's all one giant category. To really dig down, you kind of have to say, okay, it's 16-bit Windows games, which is Windows 3X, 32-bit Windows games, which is Windows 95 onward. But then within that, you have these third-party dependencies like DirectX, and um, there's, if it's a certain kind of video card, if the drivers are compatible or not. You know, uh, or even mouse. Yeah, there's uh, so many pieces of hardware and their dependencies that come into play. And I think that the challenge is some old Windows games can run on a modern computer with compatibility settings. Others don't. Because it's not this direct delineation, I have to imagine that the people that are creating these emulators aren't looking at it like a very specific thing that they can tackle. It has to be, because you, know, you got like PCEM and 86 box, you've got these emulators out there that can run a Windows 95 or Windows 98 machine. In general, however, you have to have a beast of a computer to even approach you know, speeds that are, are not stuttery. But beyond that, there's all kinds of other little issues. You know, we're dealing with a lot of games with 3D accelerated. Uh, back on Exodus, we can support the 3D effects games. But by the time you get to Windows 95, 98, you're dealing with like the Voodoo cards, the Voodoo 2 cards. And these require completely new, you know, emulations to be written for them. So unlike a Nintendo where it's like, okay, we got the sound chip, we got the CPU, we got the graphics driver, we're done. Any kind of PC emulation requires, okay, we have a multitude of motherboards we have to figure out. We have a multitude of sound cards, a multitude of video cards. We have add-on cards we have to worry about. We have networking cards. We have so many things. And we have to not only emulate all these different pieces, but then make them modular. So you can kind of move them around and plug them together different ways to say, I want to make this kind of machine to make this game run. And so it's a very complicated moving target. Wow. Yeah, I don't know what the answer to that would be. I think I mean, it's going to require... Really, people. maybe some type of cloud computing solutions, about the only thing... That's one way to go. I think that the solutions are there, but we just need the people to. It's kind it's of. Gonna, like... It's going to surprise people. With, with, I, you know, people like us get it, but you know, I could imagine somebody saying, "Well, why would I need a beast of a computer to run this yeah. old game from you know? <laughs> you know this this ran fine on my you know twenty year old uh, computer. Why? <laughs> I think emulation comes out of necessity, and people have not seen it as a necessity yet. If you look at console emulation. There's a good PlayStation 3 emulator out there. There's even a pretty good PS4 emulator out there. There's not an Xbox 360 emulator that's good. There's some really kind of minimal ones. There's even not there's not a, even a great original Xbox emulator out there. Why? Because those games are predominantly backwards compatible. Not all of them, but most of them I can take and stick in my Xbox X and it'll play. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that's not a necessity to go fix that. And I think that that's true for the 9X games too. Enough of them are available through Steam and GOG. You know, oh, I can play Half-Life? Okay, cool. You know, that, that's the only one I cared about. Or, oh, I can play Diablo 1? It's been, it's been remastered? Okay, cool. If you knock out the big guys, the, the, the really big targets that people want to get to, right? and enough of the medium targets can be played with compatibility settings, then as an emulation designer, not that I am one, but if I was one, do I, is there, is there a lot of benefit to me to tackle this thing if it's only going to enable a bunch of mid-level to low-level games that most people probably don't care about? I would say yes, from my position, but I can see why they don't always see that as being the most glamorous goal, uh, the most rewarding goal to go for. Yeah, I think you worded it really well on your the little write-up you sent me. You were talking about how Really, we only have three or four percent of that of those games that are really commercially viable. Probably most people have never even heard of a good you know, ninety percent of this stuff. <laughs> uh, but you know, we wouldn't accept that with any other genre. You know, no. if this was film or music or, or yeah, uh, literature, you know, we wouldn't accept that. Yeah, the three percent number comes from taking the number of games I have in Exodus. And dividing that by the number of DOS games you can buy on Steam or good old games combined that are DOS era games. 
And I think I came up with like 3.4%, 3.5%. Now, granted, the numbers are skewed a little bit because Exodus is full of a lot of homebrew games. So I'm kind of saying out of all the games that were ever released for DOS, this percentage of them is are available in some kind of legitimate commercial format. But my numbers are skewed the other way too, because there's dozens, if not more, that I don't even have in my database that were commercially sold. We Every year we find more games that we thought, we're like, oh, okay, well, there's probably not a lot of commercial games left. And here comes three more. And it happens all the time because there is no such thing as a complete database of every DOS game out there. That's mm -hmm. part of the challenge. We're, we're collecting what we don't, we don't know the upper limit of what we're trying to build. It could keep going and it will always keep going. But when you're dealing with three to 4% of the commercial games being available out there, it, you know what it comes down to? Is people say, can I play Doom? Can I play Monkey Island? Can I play King's Quest? Can I play the Sierra games? Can I play the LucasArts games? I play X-Wing. <laughs> X, yeah, XCOM, X-Wing, Star Wars games. Like if you take the top 100 to 150 DOS games from popularity and you were to say, let's knock all those off the wish list, you've probably taken out a good 90% of the wish list. The rest of it's going to be, at least for the people's top, top game. The rest of them are going to be games that they played, they downloaded from a bulletin board system one day and they have a fun memory of it. Or they happen to get it at their local flea market when discs were sold in a, in a plastic baggie and you just bought and sold discs for a couple of dollars from guys at the flea market. Um, it's dangerous because magnetic media, optical media, these are all non-permanent solutions to storing data. The magnetic media in a perfect environment, temperature controlled, everything, tops 50 years. And that's coming from experts that study this kind of stuff. The same is true for optical media, solid state media, moving platter hard drives, nothing has a lifespan of more than 50 years, at least from a, uh, a practical perspective. Not to say it can't last longer than that, but you're really rolling the dice any time you pass 50 years on this stuff. Now that's in a perfect scenario. Yeah, the reality of it is- I have, a, I have an example for you about this. Sure. The Apollo 11 and the NASA uh, telemetry, uh, telemetry, they say that telemetry data? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so all of that lost, mm -hmm. you know, for exactly the reasons you're talking about. I mean, some, I mean, it just blows my mind that something so historically vital as that. And that's a good example of data that the public couldn't couldn't have preserved because NASA had 100% control over that data. And mm -hmm. someone just, they were so busy looking forward and trying to solve the next problem that they didn't have archivists on staff that said, hey, what about our past? And I think archivists, need that you know my partner is uh, working on her master's degree in in history she's an archivist and oh cool when we first when we first met she's i told her what i did and she was like why why would anyone care about the history of games and this is coming from an archivist and i once i explained it you know she was like oh yeah okay i can kind of see that now she didn't mean it derisively she just meant it from like she had never thought of it before to her video games were still this kind of new thing that didn't have a lot of his history behind them. And we run into this bias all the time. It's the idea, I mean, are video games art? You know, it depends on what side of the tracks you're standing on. I, I can't convince you it's art if you don't believe it is, but it's no less art to me than any film or music. Or other I mean, is modern art art? I mean, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't, won't, they can't even settle that, you know, much less, you know, question like video games. <laughs> exactly. I use the anecdote about my partner because she, is someone who studies history and loves history. And so if I had to explain to her why the history of gaming is important, then it's not surprising that your average person wouldn't consider the importance of it. Like if NASA wasn't thinking about their own history when it came to the Apollo tapes, it's not surprising to me that Activision doesn't give a crap about the history of Sierra, which they own most of those games now. Like they're the ones that ultimately mm -hmm. have the ability to decide to release that ultimate King's Quest version we hypothetically just talked about earlier. But if, you know, from a numbers perspective, if they don't think they can make X amount out of it, they're not going to bother. They're not even going to touch it. It's not worth paying a lawyer to go dust off the rights to even touch it. Yeah, that's the thing I think that most people don't understand. You know, and I, you know I talk to students about this all the time. They, the, the problem, how hard it is to get permission. Yeah. 
I mean, it's they think it's this easy thing. Well, you just contact the publisher and you, you know, you figure out who the copyright holder is and you get, you know, permission to. <laughs> so, so you probably know a lot more about this than I do, but it sounds like that's that's one of your kind of reasons to. Uh, for the project, right, is to make sure that you do you do have permission because you don't want to be in this, you know, it's good enough for now kind of uh, a gray area, I suppose. I have to work within a certain kind of limbo. Uh, this is something that came up. I was trying to think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you asked, you asked Frank Cifaldi about this, too, and you said, what do we do about game preservation? And, you know, this answer you gave was perfect, but it was also the common one. It was, hey, look, I don't have the solution for it, but I do what I can. All right. And I agree with that. We all have to do what we can. But I also feel like at some point we have to find a way to take the conversation to the people who can make a change. And that's the publisher, the rights holders. I have to somehow get in a room with people that don't have time for me. They don't care about what I do. They don't. That is the easier to tell me, go away and stop distributing our stuff or we're going to threaten you with legal action. Now, what works for me is nothing that I'm distributing. Is worth anything to them right now. So. You know, it's one of those things like, are we going to pay a lawyer $10,000 to go protect our copyright for something that we're not actively trying to sell? Now, anytime someone has reached out to me, and there hasn't been a lot of instances of this, most people just, uh, you know, again, to use Frank as an example, I think he said he got one call one time from somebody in the entire time he's been doing what he does. Um, and in my case, it was the same thing. Konami reached out to me and they did they wanted me to remove Metal Gear Solid from my collection, which made me laugh because Metal Gear Solid is a PlayStation game that's not in my collection. <laughs> I don't have PlayStation <laughs> games. I have Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2, which at the time they were giving away free on their website. They were just giving them out. Hey, download these games. We're, we're trying to get you to buy our new Metal Gear game. So in celebration of it, here's our old ones for free. So I was like, I'm giving out the same games for free that you guys are giving out for free. And, but what it really came down to is they didn't really write that to me. A lawyer who was on retainer that doesn't know what they're even talking about did a tech search, saw the word Metal Gear pop up and said, oh, auto draft a letter, send it off to that guy, cease and desist. And when I wrote back and I said, I'm not doing anything, they didn't even bother replying. They were like, all right, fine, whatever. You know, that's the problem is everything has been bought and bought and bought. Back in the 90s, you had dozens and dozens of these independent publishers that get bigger and bigger. And then EA would come and suck them up or Interplay would come and suck them up and Activision would come and suck them up. And then now we've got Disney has come along and they own LucasArts. They wanted Star Wars. They wanted Indie. But what they don't realize, I don't think, is that they own Monkey Island. They own Sam and Max, at least the, the game rights, not the char comic character rights. They've got all these games, LucasArts put out so much stuff. They did all these uh, amazing war sims back in the day, these flight simulators, The Dig. Um, they have all the stuff in their catalog. And they don't do anything with it because it would cost more money to dig out the rights than it would than they think it's worth. That's the part of it that drives me crazy. Is that, you know, I get that they don't, it's like they don't care about, about it enough to make it available in any, any form. Mm -hmm. I do care about it enough to hire these lawyers or whoever this is to go out and try to keep other people from making it available for whatever reason. You know, I'm like, I, I don't, I, I don't understand why they care. You know, why, they remember, it, why would you want to take this down when you're not selling it or you're not, you have no plans whatsoever to ever make this <laughs> and nobody's ever going to care about this, never going to make any profits for you. So what are you doing here? <laughs> I think it's important to remember that the lawyers are not being hired specifically to protect these old games. They're hired to protect any IP at all for these companies. And they're not differentiating between a game from 1985 to a game they put out last week. Like the new Star Wars Survivor comes out, you know, Jedi Survivor comes out last year, but then there's X-Wing. And if they're searching through sites that are distributing games, they see the word Star Wars and they go, nope, that's, they don't, they're not looking at anything, any details because they are literally just on retainer. If they don't, if they don't send these letters out, they don't get their, Retainer. So they're not educated in what they're trying to take down, and they're not getting direct instructions a lot of times from the company who hired them. Disney's got better things to do than worry about this kind of stuff. You know, even the most litigious companies like Nintendo, they leave a lot of stuff alone online. Now, the second you start selling their IP, mm -hmm. you know they're going to show up. That's like throwing, you know, meat in front of a bear. You're asking for them at that point to show up. 
But I, there's plenty of sites distributing Nintendo stuff right now that as, soon, as long as they're not releasing it as a major project, hey, here's, here's my new Zelda I made using original assets. Uh, or here's my ROM site and you can download all these crazy ROMs but pay a subscription fee and here's a bunch of advertising I can make off of it. Yeah. Once you start doing that, they show up. And, you know, luckily I'm not dealing with Nintendo uh, IP because that would probably create a scenario for me. I mean, in my case, I have talked to dozens, if not more, rights holders that have said, hey, here's my original master copies. Here's my uh, unfolded game box from, you know, 1982. Uh, please scan this stuff for me. If you can get it running, please send me a copy because I can't even play these old games. Yeah, I've, I've had the, the same experience a lot, a lot of times a game developer. I don't know who yeah. has this game I made. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, Penguin Soft was an older company and they, they worked on a lot of the original old RPGs like Rogue. And I found one of the developers from them lived in my city and I found him on LinkedIn. So I reached out to him. I said, hey man, we cannot find a copy of this one particular game anywhere. And he goes, oh, man, I haven't thought about that in 30 years. Well, if you find a copy, let me know. <laughs> you know, that's that was his response to me. It was like, I don't know. We don't have any of that stuff. We they were blowing and going back then. They were designing games and then getting bought by other companies. And as soon as you finished the game, you went to the next game. Nobody was standing around saying, here, let me put all this in a box for safekeeping for later. <laughs> no one. They'd take the same disc and just overwrite it again. Uh, Romero tells a funny story where his original copy of Rescue Rover back when he worked for Gamers Edge before it was even a thing he had written a copy to this disc and then somebody bought a share or a floppy from id later or Gamers Edge and they were looking at the, the bytes and they saw that there were files that had been erased but not removed and when they un-erased these files it was the original prototype of Rescue Rover so someone had just yeah. grabbed a disc he was developing on Slapped the label on it, copied it, and sent it off to a subscriber. And, and that's that's what happened to his prototype disc. And he was like, wow, I can't believe you all found this. This is so cool. Uh, that shows how little people were thinking about preservation at, at that point. You don't live too far from Richard Garriott's house, I would think. Yeah, I think he's down in like the in Austin, right? You haven't uh, been to his, uh, his archives with all those no. origin. <laughs> I have a running joke on my server. The Ultima games haunt me, man. The Ultima games are like, we have a GitHub where we have tickets for bugs in games, and there is always an Ultima bug that I'm trying to squash at some point or another. Those games have just, they've haunted me for years. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying I don't like the games, but man, those games, they never go away from me. <laughs> we're just, was having some discussion with him. It's probably been several years ago at one point. But I remember at one point he was looking for somebody that would come and just archive his huge, because apparently he kept everything. Oh, that's cool. So he's just got it all, but you know, he, he was really uh looking for somebody that would I guess have the expertise that would be able to properly classify and you know archive all that stuff. So you might be the guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something to think about. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, me or Frank Cefaldi would probably be the two guys best handling, you know, he's got that whole company behind him up there. So he's got a lot of resources, whereas uh for as big as my packs are, at the end of the day, it's still me and a ragtag bunch of volunteers. Like once I started my Discord back in 2019, that's really when the project turned from something mm -hmm. I did on my computer alone to something that turned into a worldwide project. You know, the people on my team are from everywhere. And it's really neat to see how this love of DOS games is not relegated to a specific country or a specific region. You know, we've got people from Australia and Germany, uh, the Middle East, uh, parts of Asia. When I sell my little boxes that just, you know, just the box of the manual to people, that's gone to six out of seven continents at this point. Yeah, it was, it was really cool that you were working with the Gold Box Companion. Yeah. We, well, so the, the all seeing eye and the, yeah, the mm -hmm. ultimate. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. When I reached out to those guys and I said, hey, I've got a special version of DOS Box I use because their version of the Gold Box Companion, it looks at very specific memory registers that vanilla DOS Box uses. But we don't use a vanilla DOS box because it's harder to do things like the MT32 or the Sound Canvas. So we use extended versions of DOS box and probably about a half a dozen different versions of it because there is no one copy of DOS box that can run every DOS game. They all there's all these little things in there that you have to play with. So because of that, our memory registers were different and they weren't compatible with the Gold Box Companion. Um, so I reached out and I said, Hey, you know, my name's XO and I'm doing this project and we would really love to include your software if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. No problem. He made a special, special version of GBC, uh, Goldbox Companion and All Seeing Eye. 
that use our memory registers and it comes up, you know, they added command line support for me because everything we do is through the command line through old batch files. And uh, it's really neat. Everyone I've ever talked to, everyone I've ever reached out to has been really welcoming. No one's ever said, no, <laughs> stop, <laughs> get out of here. Don't preserve my stuff. And it makes it, those games really accessible because you, you know, you, you pull these games up and it's running in a little window over here, but then up here, you've got a dynamic map that's coming out and down here. You have stats in your whole party and it's saying what that's their amazing. HP is and what they have. And I would never play those. Way to join the game. I would, as much as I love the original gold box games, there's no way I would play those without the gold box. Without it, no. <laughs> Once you've experienced it for five seconds, <laughs> you know, you don't go back to the, uh, the old way. <laughs> yeah it's uh again really neat to see those kind of um add-ons get brought into exodus with a blessing from their original authors um you know and, and how and willing the, they are and some of the other stuff you've got here so we got automatic network multiplayer i mean how huge <laughs> is that yeah you yeah. want to <laughs> imagine trying to explain ipx <laughs> <laughs> uh, to somebody yes yeah, save game transfers between games back up and transfer a lot of stuff that just makes this you know even if you have an old pc sitting around with the and you can get these games to work i think you still want to use exodus it's yeah like with the save game transfer if you start up you know quest for glory 3 it'll say hey do you have have you played one or two yet and if so you know i can go to i know where that folder is i know how to grab that file i'll import it i'll convert it and you'll have that character over here it doesn't require you you know cd backslash sierra backslash quest for glory one uh dr find the file copy move it over like all that stuff you used to have to do by hand this is going to handle it for you and on the network multiplayer uh it's you know again to go back to the DOS box is uh, already a complicated beast. And if you want to uh, make it run multiplayer, you've got to go in and enable things that are turned off by default. You have to, um, depending on if it's a serial connect, no modem game, or if it's a direct connect modem game through dial up, or if it's an IPX game, you have to do things differently. And so what I tried to do was, you know, make it so that, okay, do you want to host or join? And if you host, it tells you, here's exactly what you're going to do step by step. Because there was no normality to these games. Like, if you want to play 686 Attack Sub, it's really weird how you get into a multiplayer game. You have to kind of know that it's not going to ask you any questions about multiplayer until you're at the very last screen. Then it's going to say, oh, by the way, you want someone else to play with you? Versus a game like Doom or Duke Nukem, where right off the bat in the first screen, it shows you, okay, we got two or three people in the lobby ready to go. And... So but it's not only automating all this stuff in the back end so that you can play against other people, but it is telling you, the user, here's exactly what you're going to click on and the order you're going to click on things so that you can get through this without having to guess all day long. The first time we played a, a, a network game of Doom, you know, Doom was designed for LAN, but it was me, uh, one of my team members in France, a team member in Germany, and a team member in Australia, all playing a four-player match. And we were playing <laughs> as if we were sitting in the same room. It was so cool. That is really cool. Another cool thing we added was printer support recently. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, yeah, I remember those. Uh, uh, the game that I would want printer support on would be those Might and Magic games because at, yeah. you know, at the end of those, you could print out a certificate of completion <laughs> and put it yeah. on your wall. <laughs> That's actually a good... I'm glad you mentioned that one. I don't think I've got that set up yet, so we'll have to put that in the next patch. Um, it's, the hard part about printer support is knowing which games have it. And I rely on the community a lot to tell me, like, hey, I think... Sim City has it because it lets you print out your map of your city if you want. Um, you know, we put it for things like originally like print shop. Uh, you know, growing up, I loved making banners on print shop, and now I can do that again. <laughs> or making cards for people on print shop or little signs. I mean, you might want to have an Alf themed birthday party, right? And <laughs> yeah, um, that's yeah, that story. Um, we have an Alf party supply kit in the pack, and uh, I got an email just uh, last week from a guy who said we had a big party at the house and I made custom elf invitations using Exodus and they were a big hit. Everyone was like, where did you get these from? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you don't miss the party when you get an invitation like that. <laughs> yeah, just a couple other things, just quick stuff. Sure. I think it was really cool that you had these, the magazines, the disc magazines available. And you can yeah. click them and, and play the games and see the coconut monkey 
<laughs> magazines I mean, are really neat. Just yeah. I don't know how many people. I mean, I'm sure there must have been a lot of people watching this that had those magazines back in the day, but yeah, it's a it's a unique experience, I think. That was my primary way of getting information. You know, I didn't have a lot of money growing up. So I lived vicariously through the the stories I read in these magazines. I'd read about these games and imagine what it would be like to play them. And, you know, years later, I'd finally get my hands on the game. I could, you know, actually play this thing I had been reading about for so long. Um, it's also a history check. You know, games are mentioned in these magazines that never came out or they changed. The name changed and the features changed. The or they, yeah, there's the vaporware. And there's also the games that were like a Peter Molyneux game that were very hyped to be a certain way. And when they came out, they were very, very different. <laughs> um, you know, it's it kind of lets you see what people were focused on at the time. Um, it lets you, the advertisements gives you an idea of how people thought at a certain time. The letter section shows you the age and the concerns of the people who were subscribing to these magazines. Uh, there's You can learn a lot about what was going on in the scene of this world because magazines are about as tied to the zeitgeist as anything that you could possibly get. The, the games kind of exist in their own bubble, but the magazines were this transition thing that lives between what the game was and what the community was. And they talk to the community while talking about the game. So it gives you a bridge to the communities that existed back then. Um, it, there are games in Exodus that I don't personally like. They are offensive. They're racist. They're not good games. But I, I sat there and thought to myself, is it my job to censor these things or to preserve them as is and ultimately decided there's a lesson to be learned here we can take these games and look at them and you know i'll put a trigger warning on them or something and say hey this one's you know might not be the greatest game if you mm -hmm. couldn't tell from the the horrible name it has or you know <laughs> the, the, these screenshots whatever but i started figuring out patterns you could see some games that were really racially insensitive came from certain regions at that time um, so maybe in that region at that time, it was a lot more acceptable to talk that way. And these are things that can get whitewashed over time if we don't include them. And I think learn, you, you run the risk of not learning from your mistakes. And I think as a historian, as a preservationist, to be able to look back and see these things, whether it's the articles in the magazines, the games, whether they're good or bad, you get a really good feeling for what the truth was at the time, not what people tell you it was like to be living in 92, mm -hmm. but this is what it was like. These are, you know, snapshots of life. These, it's, the games that were not commercial, that were made by people, the homebrew games, these are direct looks into their own life. What were their interests? What were they thinking about? What were their political ideologies at the time? There's a lot to be learned here. It's, it, there's, a, there's a lot of sociology here that's not just, hey, I got a bunch of games, let's play a bunch of games. And I think the magazines are the biggest bridge to that because there is so much in them that, yeah, okay, it's cool to read the previews. It's fun to read the cheat section. Uh, but all the stuff in between it, the editorializing that takes place, I think that that's something that if we lose that, there's not a substitute for it. There's nothing else that quite speaks to how many pieces of media were designed for teenagers in 1992. It wasn't the most common, you know, demographic to target something for. And games were kind of that thing. If, if you remember the, you know, the hearings over video game violence, you had what Congress thought at the time about video games. You had what parents thought about the time about video games. Mm -hmm. Magazines were the only thing at that time that were kind of echoing the thoughts of the people who were actually playing the games, whether that was the developers or the target audience, the consumers. And that was a very different story. If I go with what Lieberman and Senator Clinton said, then, oh, my God, they're corrupting the youth of America. If I go with what the magazines are saying, you know, you have companies like IGN who are really small websites at the time running ads saying video games are not illegal, <laughs> you know, like trying to stand up for the, the rights of video games. And there's stories to be told there that, I don't know, you, you can't go to Wikipedia or Google and type in. Tell me what it was like to be a gamer in 1993. But you can read a magazine or a bunch of magazines from 93 and you can get that idea. That is such an eloquent 
<laughs> look at this guy. <laughs> and wow, and people are going to love this. Uh, one cool thing that uh, one of my staff members came up with and we're working on is it's an index of every time a game is mentioned in a magazine. And what this uh, index does is it goes through our plugin and launch box and you'll be able to, when we get this done, right click on a game and not only see all those cool extras we talked about before, you mm -hmm. know, okay, here's the code wheels and the, and the manuals and all that, but okay, right. it was mentioned in all these magazines. Here it's a preview, here it's a review, here it's an article about the making of it or whatever. Here's, you know, strategy guys and cheat codes. And so you can be like, oh, PC Gamer did a review of this. Okay, and you click on that. It opens up your PC Gamer, flips to that page, and you're looking at the review right there. So we're directly dynamically linking game mentions to the article so that it's not like just a, a big black hole of data. You know, we're talking thousands of magazines are currently in Exodus. There's literally over a thousand. I think we're at 1185 right now, and there's more coming. That's a lot to dig through. But if you can dynamically link to a game, then now that's useful information because that's the problem with data. The more you get, you get the needle in the haystack. And we don't want that. If I ever do a, a third edition of Dungeons and Desktop, I'm going to wait until this is completed because that was, I mean, what you're talking <laughs> about, it would be amazing. You know, to be just quickly see, because I remember having to go through all these different archives and mm. <laughs> pit torrents just to find these <laughs> articles. Yeah, but I mean, I think the, uh, you know, Scorpio, I like to read uh, those reviews a lot uh, that they were doing. Uh, but but to also to be instantly be able to see like letters that people would write in response to those reviews. Mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, that would be so invaluable because you could really see. So, well, here's the magazine sort of perspective, but here's these uh, fans of the game and maybe see the back and forth. Yeah. You yeah. Know, we also have not just, you know, just, commercial magazines, but we have uh, fan made magazines. We have like the Zork newsletters, you know, quest oh. posters. We have uh, <laughs> any kind of newsletter or magazines or zine that I can find that talks about this era. It goes in and we, and we try to get it scanned at high quality. Um, well, up until recently, we had every copy of PC gamer except this second issue. And someone, I wake up one morning and I log into Discord and someone's like, it's on eBay right now. <laughs> and I get on there and there's this giant pack of like 75 magazines being sold by a guy in Canada. And it's not cheap. And I was like, all right, here we go. You know, and, you know, this massive box comes in and I'm going through the whole box. And, you know, a lot of these are magazines that are in the last couple of years. But at the bottom of that box, sure enough, was issue number two of PC Gamer. And that's something that you can't find online. It's not anywhere right now. And you know, so I spend a lot of time and money searching these things out. I buy, you know, magazine scanners to try to like non-destructively scan this stuff. Because while preservation can be destructive, I try to be as non-destructive as possible when I do it. Um, you mean yeah, there's a device uh, scanning magazines? Oh, yeah. I didn't know about that. So it just it turns the pages and all that. I There are ones that will do that. The one I bought, um, it's got a flattener. It uses these little... Uh, devices to hold the pages down and they're a certain color so it knocks them out and it, it removes them from the image at the end as long as you're not over text you're fine um it auto aligns it um if there's a slight fold in the magazine because it's not totally flat it lays lasers down on top of it and can tell the difference in the laser width that oh. there's something wrong and it'll auto flatten the page for you in post processing. Thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, it's not perfect. It acts up if it's not like a white background. And unfortunately, a lot of game magazines do not have white backgrounds. But I've been working with the people who coded the back end for it to explain, hey guys, like this is great for books and like your standard, you know, good housekeeping magazine. But I'm working with really dark colored magazines that have a lot of black pages and dark colors. So they're working on aspects to it. And I learned a long time ago, if there's something that doesn't work for me as a tool, find the guy who made the tool, find the people who made the tool, reach out to them, explain why. And a lot of times they're super like open to that feedback and working with you on it. And that's been the best part about Exodus for me is I've met so many awesome people. I've made a lot of great friends that are different, whether they, they work on emulation, they work on games or developers, they or were artists on games, whatever part of the industry they came from, just enjoy games. Mm -hmm. And the community that we have over on my Discord is super open, super fun. Uh, you know, unfortunately, emulation can come with a lot of gatekeeping sometimes. There's certain websites that are not friendly when you show up. And if you don't know the answers to a question and you ask these questions, they're quick to kind of run you off. Like, go read the manual. Go read the Wikipedia. And that's dangerous for preservation. 
I mean, especially with DOS games. Think about this. How many people alive today know DOS? I, you know, just a couple thousand, 10,000 tops. I don't know. 20,000 maybe. I don't know. It's not a huge number. I now, how many people really get into it as well. Yeah. And how many of those people all know directories and launching a game? But uh, <laughs> there's certainly people that know way more than me. Sure. But then how many of those people know DOS box? So you know DOS, but now you need to run DOS on a modern system. And then of those people, how many care about games and preservation? So this keeps getting more and more niche. And so if someone shows up knocking on the door saying, hey, I've got questions, the last thing I want to do is run them off by saying, go read the manual. This is a person that could be someone who's going to carry on this idea for years after I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And every person that gets turned away by the idea of gatekeeping in the preservation community is a person who goes, ah, and goes and finds another hobby. And so I'm really vehemently against this idea of like, I only want, you know, intelligent, knowledgeable people here. That's, that's counterintuitive to the idea of preservation. Uh, I've gone this whole interview without saying once the motto of Exodus is preservation through playability. And that's really important to me because I said earlier, it doesn't matter if the game's in the museum. If you can't play it, you don't know what it feels like. It doesn't matter if the game's on your hard drive, but it's a zip file that you can't run in some way. Because unless you can play it, it's not preserved. It doesn't matter if GOG is selling it, but half the sound card options are ripped out of it and the setup files ripped out of it because it is not fully playable. It's, it's experienceable, but it's not fully playable. It does not exist in the format it was re released in. So that motto, every day I sit down and work on the project, it goes through my head and every decision I make on this project ultimately comes down to, does this make the game more playable in service of preservation? It has to be in service of preservation. You know, we have people come along, well, there's this patch that this fan made that does this, this, and this, and that makes it a better experience. Okay, we're going to go ahead and add that, but it'll be a second option. We're going to yeah. keep the game in its original format too, but we're going to say, but if you press two here, you get this other thing that was done by this guy and it's an add-on patch. It's more playable, but I'm not going to do anything to, you know, change the original game. Uh, because at that point, I've now done the exact same thing I'm criticizing others of. I've changed the, the media. Uh, I can talk about this stuff for hours. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, thanks so much. I, I do have uh, one last question, maybe the most important. <laughs> uh, what's the best way people, this is a Matt Bradley Shergy, by the way, uh, what's the best way people can support you and what you're doing? I would say the best way is through interest. Uh, we have a website. It's retro-exo.com. On that website, you can get to all my projects. They're all free. You know, I don't own the copyright to this stuff, so I'm not selling any of this stuff. Um, there are links to our community on there. People can reach out directly to me. I have a YouTube channel that talks about how my projects work, how to do things with those projects. I do deep dives into specific games, a lot of anecdotes about my own experience. I grew up in Dallas during the time that Dallas was, you know, we had id games here. We had Apogee here. 3D Realms was here. Seventh, uh, seventh, seventh level was here. Um, we had so much development going on at the time. And I was a high school kid working at CompUSA, the biggest computer store in town. And it was their flagship store. So, I, you know, I walk in the store and up oh, there's John Romero walk in the store the next day. Oh, there's the guy that played the main character from Harvester walking through, you know, um, I ran into people all the time and it really, it did two things. It removed that mystique for me. So I have no problem reaching out and talking to these people. They're, they're humans like everybody else, right? But, you know, it's easy to forget that when they are just someone who made things that changed your youth so much. And two, it gave me a really unique perspective on uh, being someone who loved gaming and loved software at a time when it was really, really booming. And kind of, I loved how it felt to be that person back then. I loved how it felt. So a lot of my preservation is trying to help take all those amazing positive feelings of exploration of these new games and everything felt limitless back then. Every game that came out felt like it could do more than the last. We hadn't been doing it long enough to have these, you know, artificial limitations of like, oh, when I say Atari 7600, you already know, or 7800, you already know like the, the, the lower and upper expectations of what that game can be. Games didn't feel like they had a limitation back then. DOS had started in 80. And at this point, we're talking 97, 98. They'd been going strong for 18 years and it was still having commercial releases in 98. And it was, these games were on par with like a PlayStation. 
Yeah, it used to do text. So my point is, I think that that feeling back then of limitlessness is something that I try to capture with the project and all the materials that go into it. Um, I love talking about it with people. I'm on my Discord every day talking with people. Uh, we have links to the Discord on my website as well. And that's the best way to support it. Join the Discord. Just talk with us. You might know something we don't know. You might have a game somewhere or a version of a game that we've never found before. You yeah. might have insight into something we don't know. And even if you don't have any of those things, we like to talk with you. We want to share time with you and hang out with you. And, you know, like I said before, the, the aspect of gatekeeping in the community really rubs me the wrong way. So I try to go the opposite. I try to be really super welcoming to people and try to be informative. Fewer gates, fewer gates more welcome mats. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> like, I, that's why I really, I jumped on the opportunity to talk with you is this is a chance to reach out to another group of folks that may have not heard of the project or may have not felt like they had anything to add to the project. And hopefully through something like this, they realize that eh, it doesn't matter if I have anything to add. All of my staff members are volunteers. I didn't recruit any of them. I never came up to any of them and said, hey, I want you to work on X, Y, or Z. They've all come to me and said, hey, I think man, nobody's ever done any videos for the whole pack. No, they haven't. That's a big task. Well, do you want me to try? I'll give you all the support you need to try. Next thing I know, this guy's you know, 5,000 videos deep, and he plays every game for 30 seconds and makes a video that's normalized, has a little watermark on it, and knocks it out for me. And that's what he does. Um, I've got two guys out of Germany that last night we released the German language pack. It adds hundreds of German games to Exodus. And it's the framework for adding more languages. We've got a French language pack coming. We've got a, a Polish, Slovak, Czechos, Czechoslovakian pack that's almost done, if not done already. Uh, we're working on a, a Spanish pack. And that really helps make this global and not just my pack of English speaking games. You know, I can't work on a, a Spanish game unless I speak the languages. I don't know if I set it up right if I can't know exactly what's going on. I can't work on a German game unless I know how it's supposed to act. I might be preserving it incorrectly if I do that. So having people that speak these languages, that care about these games, that's important. Uh, the people that work on the magazines, the people who work on every aspect of this project is people came in and said, I think I can do that. And me saying, go for it. You know, that's to me, it's not worth, if I assign a project to somebody, they're not going to do nearly as good of a job as the person who just volunteers and thinks that that's what they want to do. And for the thousands of members we have in our discord, you know, not everyone finds something to do in the project, but that doesn't mean that they're not contributing in some way. Um, you know, we have all kinds of ways to contribute to the project, but the number one is to just join, read about it, talk with us. And most people, if they want to, they find a way to help. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll post the link, definitely post the links to the Discord, the YouTube channel, but of course, Exodus. But thank you so much. This has been great. You're a really great speaker. I think. <laughs> thank you. You're the best uh, argument, best arguments out there, really, for more <laughs> taken care of. I mean, wow, really impressive stuff, and press for the project as well. So thank you. <laughs> for thank you, man. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I know you're sincere. So, uh, folks. Check out the uh, Discord channel. And pew, that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back soon. Uh, I've been playing a game called War Tales uh, pretty religiously these days. Uh, they just put out a new pirate-themed expansion, so I've been all over that. Uh, so I might end up covering that uh, for the next episode. We'll see. Uh, but I always like to hear from you your thoughts on guests. Uh, games you'd like to see on the show and whatnot. Always happy to hear from you. Uh, and as always, I want to thank you very, very, very much. Thank you so much uh, for supporting Match Chat, especially these days. <laughs> it's kind of the, the time of need uh, here at the, uh, at the Matt Cave. So, you know, if for whatever reason you've been holding back, now would be a really good time. Uh, your support would really make a difference. Now, let me open up the old fanny pack here because <laughs> uh, we got some new restaurants I wanted to talk about yes Tim John and Ink Twire so welcome to the pack the Rat Slayers Guild <laughs> hope to see you over on the uh, discord channel uh, so I mean that discord channel is probably the best thing I think I've ever done <laughs> for, uh, to support the show I mean we got some amazing stuff amazing people on there 
Uh, so I think you're going to have a good time uh, if you join that Discord. Uh, so anyway, thanks once again for supporting the show, supporting me on Patreon. Just a couple of bucks. <laughs> I kind of miss it. <laughs> a slice of pizza, a slice of cheddar, and you're good to go. Uh, so thank you once again to everyone who has taken that all-important step towards awesome. All right. What about that news from the Matt Cave? We got a bunch of news here. A lot again, all this is on Discord. I can't cover it all, uh, but here's the, some of the top three things that really caught my eye this time. And I believe it's all for Miko Selva. So Miko's been working overtime. Um, awesome reporter on the beat, keeping us surprised. All these awesome CRPG developments. Let's see, first up is a game called Zoria, Age of Shattering. Yes, this is a, uh, it's not released yet. They got a demo you can play, but the official release date is March 7th, 2024. Uh, so not too far away. Now, this is a squad-based tactical RPG with fluid turn-based combat. Maybe it's underwater. Yeah. Outpost and followers management. Set in the expansive fantasy world of, you guessed it, Zoria. Lead a team of four heroes with their unique skills and perks. Every team member contributes to Undertaken battles. Undertaker battles? <laughs> so there's like an Undertaker uh, class to this game. But all kidding aside, this thing looks pretty awesome. And I think uh, uh, they're really trying, they're serious about that fluid uh, uh, turn-based movement. So trying to make turn-based more... Uh, more active, I guess. You're not just sitting there waiting all the time for things to happen. You know, that is one of my criticisms, by the way, of War Tales. <laughs> uh, and to some extent, even Rogue Trader. You know, I don't know why uh, a turn-based game uh, makes you sit there and watch all the slow-moving creatures, you know, amble into position. You have to wait for each one to take its turn. I mean, you know, I feel like we're kind of past that, you know, in the turn-based world. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the thing should be moving at a rapid clip. You know, there's, there's no fun and uh, you should have a way either to speed up those animations significantly, uh, which a lot of games do, to be fair. Uh, but even then, sometimes you might be stuck watching those animations or waiting a long time to take your turn. So I wish they could uh, solve those problems. So I want to keep an eye on Zoria, because apparently they have uh, uh, really fixated on that as a design goal. And so I'm really curious to see what they've done with this. Uh, if they've come up with a pretty good system, I will be all about it. Uh, next up, uh, Miko uh, wrote in about a game called King's Vein. Kind of a retro classic vibe to this one. Uh, reclaim the infested castle city of King's Vein. Ride into its depths on your trusty wyvern. Is it, yeah, sometimes I hear people say wyvern. <laughs> uh, I think it should be. I don't know if it's if what it's supposed to be, but wyvern just sounds better to me. That's so what we say, wyvern. Uh, lead your uh, customizable party of knights and mystics in deep tactical combat. Customize your team by mixing and matching 15 different classes. You know, I always wonder if those classes are all really unique or are they some, sometimes they'll have combinations of other classes and call that a new class. <laughs> Pathfinder. <laughs> uh, each with upgradable abilities and equipable passives. That's a... They need to work on there. <laughs> <laughs> description. <laughs> yes, we have equipable passives. <laughs> oh, equipable passives. You had me at equipable passives. <laughs> Talk about jargon. What the hell is that even? You know, I think it's, I don't know, some kind of item that you put on that gives you an ability maybe. Now, uh, Snappy Snapper has played this demo, or maybe he's played the, the full game. Yeah, I guess it's officially released now. $17.99 on Steam, uh, but Snappy Snapper uh, has a snappy review for this. He says it uh, has kind of a, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, kind of an Ultima vibe, plays like some of the console game, console uh, um, role-playing games, but gets very flexible and deeper the more you play, uh, which I always like that. Uh, so give it a go. That's uh, King's Vein, $17.99 on Steam. And finally, there's uh, Legends of Amberland, not to be confused with Amber Moon. Remember that one? <laughs> now, this is Legends of Amberland 2, uh, the Song of Trees. You know, it sounds kind of like some, you know, <laughs> some adolescent girls uh, fan, <laughs> fanfic, <laughs> Amberland. Uh, but no, this is a, um, uh, let's see, 
a classic Western RPG, in other words, CRPG, inspired by great 90s era games such as Might and Magic, Wizardry, uh, Ultima, and the Gold Box series. I said, wow, <laughs> if they're able to leverage all that, <laughs> this will be fantastic stuff. Uh, let's see, light fairy tale, epic, heroic, slightly humorous adventure. Wait a minute. So it's light, fairy tale, but it's also epic, heroic, and slightly humorous. <laughs> Put all that together, I suppose, into a into the old uh, instant pot and press the button. Uh, let's see what else here. Uh, classic first-person perspective, I like that. Overgrid movement. Uh, so the grid-based discrete movement through the dungeons, I guess. Turn-based system to travel in an open world with fast travel options. Thank you. And quick combat. So again, it seems to be the theme this time, right? Taking the turn base, but making it move at a rapid clip so you don't get bogged down waiting for things. Uh, you lead a party of seven, but it does not take tons of hours to complete or require an endless grind. <clears throat> Word tales. <clears throat> Basically, it's a love letter from the 90s. The golden era of RPGs. Now, I wonder if they uh, got that golden era business from a certain book. By yours truly, the epic... Dungeons and Desktops. <laughs> so maybe it's like a subtle shout out to the book. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, once again, that says Legends of Amberland 2, The Song of Trees. Pick it up for $15.99. Since on the old steam. Yes. <laughs> Why am I talking like this? I don't know. <laughs> hey, guess what I got? An ale of the week. Oh, ho, ho, but does he have an ale of the week? <laughs> How do you think? What? Okay. Uh, so this one is one I got. Actually, you'll never... Can I get it to display? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I got this from Amazon. You know, I think that's the first time I've ordered ales from Amazon. You know, I didn't even know that was something that was possible, but it is. Uh, this is a Klost Haler. Um, Klost Haler. <laughs> Sounds like some kind of asthma medication. I got took my Klost healer today. Uh, this is a dry hopped uh, Cascade hops. One of the best hops, I think. Unfiltered. Dry hopped, non-alcoholic brew. Uh, contains less than 0 0.5 alcohol by volume. Uh, it's always like to point that out because some people don't want, you know, they want zero alcohol. Uh, this has a trace amount. You know, it's not enough that's going to have any impact on you, but <laughs> if you've got... Uh, religious or dietary or whatever concerns you need to be aware of that not uh, zero percent uh, let's see what else is here uh, so it says it comes from germany by way of puerto rico is that right connecticut <laughs> three places <laughs> this thing has gone through uh, let's see any other information here canned and brewed and canned in germany okay uh, branding something got some german on the can so you know it's legitimate Oh, they actually have the ingredients here. Let's see. Water, <laughs> barley malt, hops, hop extract, and yeast. And that's all. I like that. I like not seeing strange things on the ingredients list. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you know, what I'm always asking myself with these non-alcoholic brews is, you know, is, does it taste as good as the real thing? Uh, does it make you just wish you had a real beer? Or does it you know, is it actually good enough on its own where you're satisfied with this? Maybe even prefer it uh, to beers with more alcohol. So let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, let's get some and uh, put it in a glass first, I think, so you can see the, the color. You know, there's not much to say about the can. It's kind of a Spartan. <laughs> but maybe. You know, sometimes uh, you can have a beer in a very plain can. It's quite nice. I'll just pour just a little bit in here so we can get a sense of the uh, the head. Nice, uh, really nice head on that. Lots of little bubbles inside. I'd like to see that. Not a whole lot, but you know, definitely passable, I would say. Wow, it smells really good. You definitely smell those cascade. I think the dry hopped. Um, now this is the dry hop version. I think they have one that doesn't have the dry hopped option. Uh, so I can't compare it to that one, but this one you definitely smell the hops, those Cascade really coming through. You know, it just smells really, really nice. Oh, wow. You know, I'm wondering, uh, you know, about people that don't like regular beer. Uh, maybe they don't like alcohol, maybe they just don't like the taste of beer. 
because of the alcohol, uh, I wonder if they might actually like these, uh, the non-alcoholic versions. Because you get this, ideally, you get the flavor without the, uh, you know, the nasty stuff. And I think this, uh, does it have calories? Usually these are like one calorie. Oh, this has 85 calories. And so it's probably, what, it's probably, what, about half of a Coke, maybe? Uh, so it's not a bad beverage, you know, just if you're looking for something besides <laughs> water to drink. Now let me try some out of the drinking horn, then I'll try the glass over there. And this is a Klost Haler. Nice, very citrusy, as you'd expect. Uh, a little, maybe just a little bit sweet. Uh, definitely the hoppy flavor, uh, the hoppy uh, aroma, kind of a lemon, uh, lemon balm or lemon uh, zest-like quality to this. Uh, I'll try it again. Of course, <laughs> obviously not going to have a lot of alcohol fumes or a, that sort of syrupy coffee-like taste you get sometimes. But uh, this is very light. Uh, try it again. Yeah, this is pretty good. It's not maybe just a, yeah. It's not really bitter at all. It's just kind of a kind of hoppy, a little citrusy. Is kind of how I describe this. I'll move to the glass because sometimes that makes a difference. All right, Klaus Taylor, take me away. <laughs> you know, I'm going to say this is a very drinkable. Uh, the hops are there. You know, if you didn't know better, you might think this is just kind of a one of those uh, session or saison ales uh, you know, that are for sale everywhere. Yeah, I got to say this might be uh, one of the closest ones I've tried. Uh, where if you didn't tell me, if I didn't know in advance that oh, this was a non-alcoholic uh, beer, I probably wouldn't have any reason to think otherwise. I just think it was just maybe like a, uh, a Saison. It's not as uh, intense as a lot of IPAs. I don't know if that has anything to do with the alcohol content or not, but uh, you definitely get some of the, uh, you get some of that hops flavor. The Cascade comes through nicely. It's kind of hard uh, to judge this one. You know, it's not bad. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to think about some of the other uh, NAs I've tried and where this one this one ranks. Uh, it was you can if you do a search on Google for like best non-alcoholic brews, this one comes up in, uh, in the number one slot often enough. So I really want to try to get a good sense of it. Yeah, I'm gonna say I like this. You know, I could imagine. You know, going to a party and everybody's drinking beer and you, you maybe get to drive or something. So you're doing the non-alcoholic route, uh, but you don't want to miss out. <laughs> so uh, I think this Claus Taylor would be a really good, uh, a good alternative for you. Uh, again, I don't think there's no reason to think it doesn't have a wonky flavor or anything. It just tastes like a beer without the alcohol. <laughs> yeah, so this is really good stuff. Uh, the more I drink it, the more I like it. Uh, a little bit of a, you know, maybe like when you try a Diet Coke, <laughs> if you've been drinking regular Coke, <laughs> you know, it takes a while to get used to the difference, I guess. It's like, like subtle stuff that's kind of hard to describe. Uh, uh, but that's good. I think in terms of just non-alcoholics, uh, non-alcoholic beers, I think this would definitely deserves its place near the top. Uh, I haven't tried enough of these, frankly, to be able to say that. <laughs> You know, I might come back in a few more episodes after I've you know, had six or seven different kinds under my belt to uh, compare it to. But this is very solid. So I, I think I'll probably go somewhere between uh, three and four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. I'm kind of tempted to bump it up to the floor just because I like truth in advertising. <laughs> you know, they, they're making a big deal about it being a dry hopped with Cascade. And, and that really comes through nicely. Uh, but... They didn't overdo it, so it's not stupid, you know. Some sometimes a hoppy thing can just be overpowering, but this uh, really hits the mark. <laughs> you know, what? damn, I think you just like drinking this. You know, it's it's a good choice. All right, so anyway, uh, we'll go three out of five, uh, close to four out of five on that, uh, and I might revise that score later. We'll see uh, once I've tried some more. Uh, NAs. Okay, but anyway, let's wrap it up with a quote. And since we talked so much about preservation and history in this uh, chat, I was looking for uh, quotes from my favorite historian. Uh, Herodotus is up there, but, uh, but Edward Gibbon is probably my favorite just because 
uh, his uh, writing style. He's considered one of the great writers uh, of all time, not even in history, just period. When it comes to English language, he's uh, one of the best. Uh, but anyway, here's one of his quotations I thought you would like. It goes something like this. I never make the mistake of arguing with people for whose opinions I have no respect. I never make the mistake of arguing with people for whose opinions I have no respect. <laughs> you know, it sounds like he's writing about social media, doesn't it? Yes, it is. And this kind of is a bonus. Uh, his book is called Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is the one he's best known for. A really great book. You, know, you should definitely read it at some point. It's a big, thick thing, but uh, again, the writing is just mesmerizing. And I thought I'd give you a little snippet from that book as a little bonus quote, uh, and that goes something like this. It was an inflexible maxim of Roman discipline that a good soldier should dread his officers far more than the enemy. I don't know if I'd want to be in the Roman, uh, the Roman army, but uh, there you go. Uh, anyway, ponder on that, and I'll see you guys next time.